Welcome to the neighborhood, neighbor. Let's take a look around. I'm Kevin Snipes, and this is Union Project. Welcome to the land of make believe. I'd like you to see my friend Bill Strickland and his work with clay. I asked him if I could bring you with me today, so I think we should go now. Hello, I'm Bill Strickland, President and CEO of Manchester Bidwell Corporation. Welcome to my neighborhood. Thank you very much. I'll work on it. Come take a lesson from you someday, Bill. Well, thank you. There are a lot of artists in Pittsburgh. This spot is by Ed Eberly. Let's meet him. Hi, I'm Ed Eberly. Welcome to Pittsburgh. Welcome to the neighborhood. John Fetterman of Braddock, Pennsylvania, and I want to welcome you to my neighborhood. Braddock, Pennsylvania is an incredibly historic place. Please come out and check out our part of the neighborhood, and I look forward to seeing you all in the spring of 2018. We'll all see you in Pittsburgh next year. Bye for now. Everybody to Pittsburgh um, to this Inseca conference, and I can't help but think of communities uh, when I think of this three or four day event, and think about uh, all the communities that you came from, whether it's in Lincoln, Nebraska, or Cambridge, Massachusetts, or Long Beach, California. Everyone's coming from someplace, so you all have your communities where you're coming from, and then once a year, many of you come here. And this too is a type of community. And uh, some of you have been coming for many years, but I think it's really important to remember that some people are coming here for the first time, from Taiwan, uh, from all sorts of international countries, and, and from here. And many of those people that come here for the first time, I think, are astounded that there's so many people interested in something that they're interested in. But one of the things we've often been talking about is how to expand our sense of community. And I've been hearing just a couple things, I'll mention them briefly, that I'm just astounded by what people are doing to expand the community of people that are involved in ceramics. And one of the things that I've recently heard about are a couple of students at Syracuse are starting this program called Clay Siblings. 
and they've contacted a myriad of high schools in the Pittsburgh area, and they've matched up college students uh, to come into these high schools in Pittsburgh and teach high school students. This is all initiated by them. And it happened uh, last year in Portland, and it's growing here. And this was so, sort of self-initiated uh, by college students. And I just want to commend the couple of uh, Syracuse students that got this off the ground, Gerald Brown and Mike Tavares. And uh, it's some, someone said there's a great turning happening, that something is happening in this country. And I think it's true. And uh, with the recent thing that high school students are organizing down in Portland called uh, March for Our Lives, and they're collaborating with all the high school students in Washington, D.C. area for places for them to stay when they come up to Washington to have this march in, uh, in March, March 26, I think. And so this is all just being initiated by students. And uh, it's an exciting time. And I think Inseca is very much involved with uh, this great turning in more ways than one. So thank you for all being here. And I'd like to uh, introduce the hosts uh, for the conference that will be happening in Minneapolis next year. And uh, they've already done a tremendous amount of work. And I'd like to introduce uh, Sarah, Sarah Milfred, who's the executive director of the Northern Clay Center. And I know I butchered that last name. I'm really horrible at names, so I apologize, Sarah. Consistency, thank you. <laughs> She's also got a great sense of humor. So, and also to uh, Keith Williams, who is the uh, former president of Inseca. Thanks to you both. aren't used to seeing such a good-looking group of people on stage. My real name is Sarah Milfell, but my friends call me Sarah Milpitt. So <laughs> this is Keith, Keith Williams. I'm going to let him talk eventually. They didn't tell me what to say or how long to talk, so anybody who knows me behind a microphone knows that you don't know. So um, Keith and I are beyond the healthy level of excitement for you guys to come to Minneapolis. So picture what an unhealthy level of enthusiasm is. And I have some friends in the audience that share that level of enthusiasm. Um, Minneapolis and the greater Twin Cities is home to some amazing creative individuals and institutions. Um, we boast dozens of strong programs in ceramics from community colleges to universities. Um, it's the home of Continental Clay, Smith Sharp Fire Brick, a little place called Northern Clay Center, the Upper St. Croix Valley Pottery Tour, and Keith Williams, and the list goes on. Um, it's where Prince hails from, as you guys know, and we love it. We can't let go of that, and apparently Bob Dylan is from Northern Minnesota as well. Um, we have more ceramic artists per capita than any y'all around the country, and that is a statistic that's substantiated by no one, but I know it <laughs> by Keith. I know it to be true. Um, it's home, Minnesota is home to an incredibly healthy state arts board, and there's numerous private foundations that support artists of all disciplines. We have the Wiseman Museum, the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, the Walker Arts Center, the American Craft Council moved from the coast to come here, um, here, Minneapolis. Um, and amongst dozens of other highlights, Minneapolis is home to Keith Williams' hat collection, um, which numbers over 50 now. And that just may, in and of itself, be a concurrent exhibition <laughs> as part of Enseca. I'm working on that. I need, I need an underwriter. Um, I've talked to a lot of people today and everybody leads with, well, it's gonna be so cold. Like, we're very good. Like, what you had today, everybody, is what you're gonna have. So you bring the right stuff and you get prepared and you check that at the door. We know it's gonna be cold, bring your good attitude. We deal with it nine months out of the year. We expect you to deal with it for four and a half days. Um, boom. So, Keith and I and an incredible team of helpers from the Twin Cities, if you're on that team, you can just give a quick little whoop whoop. Okay. 
Um, we are excited to share with you our promo video, and um, we produced, and it's supposed to whet your appetite for Minneapolis, and one of the days we filmed it was like minus nine, and that was in November. Um, and I want you guys to know too that the video is already receiving Oscar buzz, so it's kind of, kind of a big deal. She does the, the, the acceptance speech. I'm super stoked we're going to Nsika for our second time, Claytopia. Yeah. This is my first one. Did any of you guys download the Nsika app? Like three months of ago. Of course. Totally. You guys have your donation cup for the Nsika mug sale though? Totally. Yes, of course. Did everybody remember to bring all of their extra winter clothes? Winter clothes? What are winter clothes? We're going to Minneapolis, Minnesota, you guys. You need your gloves, your hats, your scarves, two extra long sleeve shirts, snow pants, and your winter jacket. Matt, that was a great break, but do you need a break from driving? No, it's only 1,042 more miles to Minneapolis. But first, Montana. Look at all that sky. Uh, guys, listen, it's another Nsika ad. Calling all fans of Clay. Get in your cars, trucks, planes, trains, and buses and head west, Midwest that is, to Minneapolis, Minnesota for Claytopia, the 53rd annual Nsika conference, March 27th to 30th, 2019. Slurry, talk to me about Claytopia. Oh, geez. Maybe I should just pump you up about Minnesota Clay. Because you're going up north, don't you know? Oh, yeah, you betcha. There's the St. Croix Pottery Tour, the Western Wisconsin Pottery Tour, the Northern Clay Center. Slurry, where's Warren's place? Warren McKenzie, noted North American craft potter, lives on a lovely acreage in Western Stillwater, Minnesota, don't you know? Or I could route you to Randy Johnston's wood kiln. I hear they're firing right now, and Warren might be there. Thank you, Slurry. Oh, it's no problem. I'm so happy to do it. Clay, something that exhibits the qualities of, quote, clayness, unreal, weird, essentially a person whose physical appearance or personality has the ability to blow your mind. Hashtag unreal. Hashtag incredible. Hashtag strange. It's so hard being both a mother and an artist. Jeepers, I'm super excited about that NSICA conference. <laughs> Randy and Jan are both here. Jandy's here. I can't believe the same firing as Ken Jagawa and Warren McKenzie. And here's Jeff Astrike and Mark Ferris. God, I'm f excited about firing with Buckthorn. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hot. Uh, I was heading east, and uh, Sandy Simon told me to stop by. There's some hot soup. I remember what I was doing during the last week. I was unstacking a firing, and it was a crappy one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I left making pots to come over here just to see all my old friends, and it's wonderful here. Absolutely perfect. Warren got us all into this mess starting <laughs> about 1968, and we're still at it. <laughs> I'm one of the victims, too. Longest survivor <laughs> as a sidekick. <laughs> I am just so happy that I got to meet Bob Brady and Linda Christensen today. <laughs> Whoa, another Nsika ad. Turn it up! Breaking news. Claytopia has been discovered. We repeat, Claytopia has been discovered. Creative visionaries from around the United States and abroad are jumping onto the closest plane, train, or automobile and descending upon Minneapolis, Minnesota to experience Claytopia, the 53rd annual conference for the National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts. Hey, let's hit the snack shack. Oh my god, plaid on stripes? Plaid on stripes? That's Mike Helke. The rumors are true. He really does wear a toque every day. Play courses through the Earth's veins to serve basic needs while also igniting the human imagination. Claytopia, Minneapolis, 2019. Oh, Kippo Cronley. I love her dress. You know, she makes her own clothes and has totally fabulous pockets. The keynote lecture, the Randall session, demonstrations, panel discussions, yeah, exhibitions, are. emerging artists, it's all so perfectly dreamy. Yeah. 
Rebecca Groves. She looks just like her pots. Her mugs are the best. I don't see any handmade objects here. I wonder if I could sell my humble mugs here. That's Liz Pekacek. She's the trifecta potter, sculptor, and jeweler. 371 days till Enzika 2019. Picture it. Claytopia. Keith's gonna give a private concert in his room later. That was him. <laughs> he, he was the soundtrack. I've learned that I have a sax addiction. <sighs> My wife would be disappointed with that joke. <clears throat> so, Sarah told you the straight party line that it's going to be cold up there. I'm not supposed to be reveal this secret, but we've actually already uh, made plans to put Minnesota on casters and wheel it to the tropics, as Sarah's dress would indicate. The Bahamas. So uh, I'm simply going to say, please come, please enjoy. It's going to be great. We do have this great energy and this great team, and it'll be, it'll be wonderful. It's my pleasure now to introduce our current hosts. So, if I can say a couple of words. Kate Leiden is the Director of Exhibitions at the Society for Contemporary Crafts, SCC, in Pittsburgh. She oversees uh, the organization and installation of exhibitions uh, presented at SC, Main uh, Strip uh, District Gallery, and at the BNY Mellon uh, Satellite Gallery in downtown. Kate has more than 25 years of experience at SCC and offers a strong working knowledge of the contemporary craft field. Her efforts in the field and at SCC at large are memorialized through SCC's LEAP Award, which is the Leiden Emerging Artist Program, uh, established in 2007. The program recognizes exceptional emerging talent in the contemporary craft field and provides opportunities for the, these early career artists to bring their artwork to the consumer market. The year-long retail program features markets and sells the work of one winner who also received a $1,000 prize. It's quite a program. Congratulations, Kate. Great stuff. Thanks for being uh, uh, one of our hosts. Kate received dual degrees, by the way, in art history and French at Denison University in Granville, Ohio, and her master's from the Archival Museum and editing program at uh, uh, Duquesque University in Pittsburgh. Je ne parle pas la français. Uh, uh, prior to joining SEC, Kate served as registrar for the Frick Art uh, and Historical Center in Pittsburgh and exhibitions coordinator at the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts. She joined the Board of Governors of Aramont uh, School of Arts and Crafts in Gatlinburg, uh, Tennessee in 2006. Uh, she's old school, preferring a phone chat to email and texts, so I'm told. Uh, her Facebook page is peppered with cat videos. Well, that, that was me. And why not? Yeah. And uh, from one administrator to another, I'm asked to pass along, uh, she's one of the best in the business. Um, and then there's Shoji, born in Kyoto, Japan, and raised in Anchorage, Alaska. He received his BA in studio art in, uh, in government from the College of William and Mary in 1996, uh, explaining a, a, an unusually broad knowledge of uh, Robert's rules of order. He received his MFA from the Indiana University in Bloomington, 2004. Uh, Shoji currently resides in Morgantown, West Virginia with his artist wife, Jennifer Allen. She's an assistant professor, yes. he is, sorry, he is an assistant professor of ceramic uh, uh, area head in West Virginia University. Uh, Shoji has also taught at Indiana University, Hope College, and Central Michigan University. 
Shoji has conducted workshops and exhi exhibited nationally and internationally. Some of his most recent activities include the artist residency at the Robert M. McNamara Foundation uh, in Westport, Maine, uh, summer visiting artist workshops in Jingdezhen Ceramics Institute in the People's Republic of China, and recent exhibitions including solo, two-person, and multiple group shows throughout the U.S. and China. He eats, sleeps, drinks clay, and does more in a given day than many of us do in a week's time in the clay world, and yet he seems to love fly fishing even more than clay. The man, the legend, Choji. Thank you both. Hello, neighbor. Welcome to the neighborhood. Shoji and I are honored to welcome the Ensika community of makers, educators, thinkers, writers, curators, and collectors to Pittsburgh. This year's theme, Cross Currents, Clay, and Culture, reflects on Pittsburgh as a city of rivers, bridges, complex immigrant history, gritty perseverance, and reinvention. For the 52nd annual conference, in concert with the NSICA board, we challenge the membership and ourselves to cultivate greater diversity in the field of ceramic art through simple, direct, and meaningful gestures. As we gather for what promises to be a thought-provoking conference, we challenge you to consider how are we grappling with issues to keep clay vital in classrooms, museums, and community settings? How are we learning from and adapting to the interplay of cultures in the contemporary world? What is at stake as we work to sustain cultural legacies in a shifting present and unknown future? Over 100 concurrent exhibitions have been placed in countless art centers, libraries, and community ceramic studios throughout, this, throughout our city as well as Braddock, Homestead, Carnegie, and Sewickley. These shows and neighborhoods are waiting to be discovered. A jewel in, our jewel in Pittsburgh, Manchester Craftsman's Guild, has been a champion for ceramics and crafts since its founding in 1968 by a visionary Bill Strickland. Established to help combat the economics and social devastation experienced by the residents of Strickland's predominantly African American Northside neighborhood. MCG will host two important exhibitions, Found Again and Funk, American Dada. So I highly recommend you guys get out there. It's some really good shows. Like, MS, uh, like Manchester Craftsman's Guild, West, West Virginia University plays host and is committed to fostering an environment where students can maximize their learning experience. I personally want to thank uh, my dean, um, Dean Keith Jackson, who's sitting right over there, and uh, my director, Allison Helms, um, and also, really, my students. None of this would have been successful without the countless hours of volunteer work that, are, that my students put into really making this a successful conference. And I really personally want to thank them. So. So. Also, to my colleague, Boomer Moore, uh, Shalaya Marsh, and uh, Kelly O'Brien, even though Kelly's now teaching at the University of Dallas, we're really also instrumental in, in all the prep work that we did for this conference. And of course, my best friend partner and my favorite potter in the whole entire planet, uh, my wife, Jennifer Allen. Um, all your guys' support in the last few years have meant so much to me. And even though my kids are enjoying the hotel room with their grandmother, because I fly my mom in from Alaska to watch our kids for Ensika. Um, <laughs> and so they're not here, but um, they've, been a, they've been a huge source of inspiration for me as we think about the future of our organization and our field. Uh, the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts exhibits the work of prom uh, prominent emerging and contemporary artists in gallery, cinema, and public settings, and they play host to the amazing National Student Juried Exhibition that was juried by ceramic artists Sam Harvey and Martina Lampton. If you haven't been out there, the reception's tomorrow night, and I really recommend you guys go. And Standard Ceramic Supply, a mainstay of the region since 1960, through 
the Pittsburgh Carnegie Area Manufacturing Plant and the Ceramic Supply Incorporated in Chicago and, and New York um, have really supplied schools and professional ceramic markets east of the Mississippi, and they have been very generous supporters of our organization. And they've, they've organized 17 exhibitions of national regional artists, and we really want to thank and recognize Jim and Graham Turnbull for their generous support to the ceramics community. And it's been an amazing opportunity to help organize the 2018 conference and working with the phenomenal NCCA board and staff and our partners, Contemporary Craft, Manchester Craftsman's Guild, Pittsburgh Center for the Arts, Slippery Rock University, and West Virginia University. Um, it was years in advance to plan the, such a rich program of exhibitions and so, uh, so much more. And we trust that cross currents, play, and culture will provide and prove to be a, catalyt a catalytic platform for forward thinking in ceramic education, art, and research. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our executive director, Josh Green, and Bill Strickman. I'm Bill Strickland, and um, nice to be here. Uh, Josh asked if I would go first. <laughs> and be brief. <laughs> uh, so I have uh, sort of two and a half minutes or three minutes to reinforce the fact that I think that clay is a magical experience. Otherwise, this room would be empty. And it is magic for me because of the way I was introduced to the uh, process through a fellow named Frank Ross, who some of you may have known. And um, good. Well, I knew him and he saved my life. And I didn't realize at the time that what he was doing through his ex ceramic experience with me was opening up a portal so that I could have uh, a life. And that life is now manifesting itself in 10 centers that we've now built, one including one in Israel. And we have Jews and Arabs going to school together today, uh, getting along fine. Ten more are in planning as we speak, including the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. And our goal is to build as many of these centers as is possible. And finally, let me just say uh, I'm very grateful to be here because two um, uh, years ago, I had a double lung transplant. and. Um, Next week will be my two-year survival uh, of the experience. <clears throat> I only say that to say that I'm very grateful for life. I'm grateful for the surgeons. But I'm also, I made a deal with God that if I were spared, I would devote my life to the alleviation of human suffering. And so far, it appears that my offer has been accepted. And one of the motivations during the darkest days of my recovery was how do I get back to Clay? Because I had an instinctive sense that that was my lifeline back to physical and mental health. So to be standing beside really our first employee at Manchester, Josh Green, who's now the director of this operation, uh, is an extraordinary honor. And I don't believe that there's anything lucky 
about all of you. I think you're a very, very special people, and I think that you are possessed with the gift and the vision and the hope for life. And I consider myself very honored to be asked to share with you three minutes of uh, my life today. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So how lucky am I to have a mentor like that? <laughs> really spending 21 years at Manchester Bidwell and um, the community of people I've gotten to work with and especially Bill's wisdom and uh, his always faithful and hopeful attitude that this work was very hard, sometimes very slow. He always used to say, water on rock, water on rock. And I think those of us who love clay and the kind of, you know, incredible transformations and the difficulty and the consistent failure and accommodating that failure and learning from that failure and celebrating the very rare successes really understand that better than anybody. So my primary role here tonight is to welcome all of you and to introduce our keynote speaker, Erica Halverson, who is the author of numerous publications, including Film as Identity, Exploration, a Multimodal Analysis of Youth-Produced Films. Uh, she's a member of the American Educational Researchers Association and National Council for Teachers of English, Assembly for Research, and she's an executive committee member at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Teaching Academy. She earned her PhD in education, her BS, her BS in speech and theater, both at Northwestern University uh, in Evanston, just outside of Chicago. Erica is interested in how people learn in and through the arts across a range of art forms, with a focus on the performing arts. She also runs Whoopin' Soccer, which is an artist in residence program working in the Madison Public Schools. Paul Saccharides first brought her to our attention as we were planning the 2014 conference, and I remember looking at her TEDx Madison talk produced in 2011, which you all can tune into on YouTube, um, in which she talked about art and stories and the way that they have the transformative ability um, to make us discover a sense of agency and self-identity in our lives. Now, while on the surface, theater and ceramics may not seem alike, all of the arts are actually more similar than they are different. Theater and ceramics are each about creation out of elemental materials, the body, the breath, as a vehicle for form and story. Each offers pathways of resistance and acceptance through which our inner lives and stories pass through us and into the world to be shared and used by others. Erica has also been doing research with the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh, which is one of the great cultural gems of our community that's also hosting some exhibitions. And she's particularly looking at the phenomenon of maker spaces, but in a very, I think, important and unique lens. Um, one of the things that she's looking at is how kit-based kind of uh, prescribed experiences in these environments uh, generally creates different outcomes than more open-ended ones. And while the kit-based learning experiments uh, may produce a greater sense of design success, they don't match the kind of uh, identity, agency, um, and qualities of problem solving and self-resilience that have been resultant from more open-ended forms of education that I think most of us in ceramics are more familiar with. So um, in asking her to speak tonight, I was excited to learn uh, that she's been working on a book on arts education and kind of its, its role and a new vision for it in the 21st century. So like me, you've recently witnessed some humbling expressions of youth through the poise, bravery, and activism of students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. I suspect that also like me, many of you have their images and voices burned into our consciousness. Having experienced a sense of awe while watching Emma Gonzalez, few of us can argue that our world depends on education in the 21st century. 
that it has a sense of purpose, that it cultivates concepts of self-identity, agency, and the value of human life. Please join me in welcoming Erica. Wow. <laughs> oh, the prompter is too low down for me to see. Hold on, I'm just gonna move myself over a little bit. Great. <laughs> Today is a good day. Today, we celebrate the passing of one of the great scientists and activists of our time, Stephen Hawking. Today, thousands of students rose up across the country against a lack of political will to keep them safe in their own schools. So it's a good day to talk about how, as artists and educators, we can change the face of teaching and learning in this country. My name is Erica, and I'm a performing artist. I make art with my body. I make art with my voice. I'm also a teacher. I'm a professor of education at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where I study how people learn in and through the arts, and I teach future teachers how to use the arts in their own classrooms. And today, I want to talk to you about the intersection of those two roles that I play in the teaching and learning ecology. First, a little bit of a recent history lesson. Since the emergence of No Child Left Behind in the early 2000s, schooling in the United States has been reduced to an almost exclusive focus on reading and math and the improvement of test scores in these domains as the marker of successful teaching. As a result, other subject areas have been forced to justify their existence in the curriculum instrumentally. How does this subject improve students' learning as demonstrated through reading and math scores? Arts disciplines have not been unique in their need to engage in this justification though we have done our fair share of trying to explain how doing art might make you better at math or how doing drama might make you better at reading. In the 2010s, a new version of instrumentalization has greeted us, what I like to call the STEM monster. Thanks to the Obama administration, a lot of attention was placed on young people's innovation. We had maker fairs at the White House. We had young people showcasing their innovations to a nation of interested adults. However, that innovation was often framed as a vehicle into creating the next generation of engineers, of computer scientists, and of workers. Now, there's nothing wrong with computer scientists and engineers. Some of my best friends are computer scientists and engineers. However, the framing of making broadly and art making specifically as helping to create the next generation of STEM innovators remains problematic in our ways of holding the arts as in and of themselves valuable. In 2000, arts and learning scholar Julian Sefton Green, of whom I am a great admirer, described us as arts educators as still in the process of restating our claims to be proper subject disciplines in the schooling context. 18 years later, that process continues. People who teach in the arts continue to be marginalized or spend a great deal of time explaining how or what they do is worthwhile in our current curricular climate. In my work, I aim to do something slightly more radical to shift the conversation from justifying the arts as worthwhile subject areas 
to describing how the arts can change the pedagogies of traditional learning environments across subject areas. The purpose of my talk tonight is to describe how the arts can upend our current conception of teaching through an understanding of how arts-based practices can inform traditional classroom teaching, how teaching functions in the arts across learning environments, and finally, how we can design for arts-based learning experiences. And I'm going to try to say a little bit about each of these questions and the work I've done to try to promote these approaches in our schools and in our communities. First, I want to say a little about this first question, how arts-based practices can inform traditional classroom teaching. In order to answer that first question, I turn to an art form that is familiar to me as someone who trained to be a professional actor. Improvisation, or improv, is a particular form of art making that stretches across performance media. So you find improv in theater, you find it in music, in this way, improv is not really its own art form, but rather a genre of performance that can be applied across several media. Improv in theater can also refer to a process of making art, a set of tools used by actors to work on characters and scenes for performance, as well as a performance medium in and of itself that relies on a range of forms that actors use to produce scenes, songs, and monologues on the spot. Within this performance genre, improv can be characterized as sketch-based, so maybe what you're familiar with with a Saturday Night Live, uh, short form, which is longer scenes, and long form. Sometimes a group of actors will perform an entire play based on a set of ideas but with no set script. Across these genres, uh, my colleague Keith Sawyer at the University of North Carolina has identified four key features of improv. One, the outcomes are unpredictable. Two, there is moment to moment contingency. Things are always changing. Three, the people and the processes are open to collaboration. And four, the action is embedded in the local social context of the performance. While there's very little work that focuses on the role of improv in education research, or even really more broadly in the education discourse, um, Sawyer is the exception to this rule. He talks about improvisation as collaborative emergence, which is a fancy academic term that I actually quite like, as the outcome of improv, which can contribute to young children's narrative literacy. I'll say a little more about the power of collaborative emergence later. For now, I want to turn to the rules of improv as defined by American writer, actor, and comedian Tina Fey. As an actor and an improviser myself, I've been trained to use the rules I described below since I was in high school. They are foundational to me and I would imagine almost any performer would say the same. So any of you who in high school or college took an improv class, these rules are going to be familiar to you. But it wasn't until I read Tina Fey's 2011 memoir, Bossy Pants, which I highly recommend if you've never read it before, where she outlines why the rules of improv appealed to her, not only as a way of creating comedy, but as a worldview, that it occurred to me to begin explicitly outlining a theory of teaching and learning that could also be bound by these same rules. For Tina Fey, they're a worldview. For me, they're a way to reframe how we understand teaching and learning. The first thing you learn on your first day of any improv training is to say yes. Of saying yes, Tina Fey says, the rule of agreement reminds you to respect what your partner has created and to at least start from an open-minded place. Start with a yes and see where that takes you. What that means in an improv scene is that you never deny what your partner has created. It doesn't mean that you can never use the word no, 
It also doesn't mean that you can never disagree. So for example, if I start a scene by saying, I have a hand growing out of my head, the only thing you can't say is no, you don't. You might respond with, ah, that's terrifying, or how did it get there, or high five. <laughs> but you must acknowledge what I've said and incorporate it into your response. Now saying yes from an education perspective is fundamentally about a constructivist approach to teaching and learning. It reminds us as teachers that our basic interactions with students ought to be around understanding how they're contributing and why they're choosing to contribute in that way. We've all had and been that teacher who says in response to a student answer to our question, no, that's not exactly what I meant, or who has a different idea to contribute? If we take a truly constructivist stance on learning, all new knowledge is built on prior knowledge, experiences, and practices. By saying no, we are effectively severing that link for students, explaining to them that they need totally new information or ways of thinking if they are to answer our questions correctly. Of course, the answer can be wrong, especially if your question is informational or if you're asking students to say something for the purpose of summarizing. But saying yes reminds us, though, that our job as teachers is not to elicit the right answer, but rather to build connections for learners between what they bring to the learning environment and what you want them to get out of it. Tina also tells us, I call her Tina sometimes, I pretend we're friends. Um, <laughs> Tina also tells us the second rule of improvisation is not only to say yes, but yes and. You are supposed to agree and then add something of your own. Yes and means don't be afraid to contribute. In an improv scene, adding something of your own moves the scene along. The purposes of a scene is to get from point A to point B, even though you don't know in advance what those two points are. But movement is not possible if no one contributes new information. And it's much more difficult if only one person is doing the contributing. The most skilled improvisers make it look as if they are not doing anything while their choices continue to move the scene along. In progressive pedagogy, it is de rigueur, popular to avoid lecture, focus on student discovery of rules, concepts, and ideas, which is grounded in the notion that constructivist epistemology, so the idea that all knowledge is built on other knowledge, requires constructivist pedagogy. So since learning is discovery, pedagogy must also be discovery. However, learning scientists have demonstrated that there is a time in a student's learning trajectory when they are cognitively prepared to be told the answers to complex questions, and that this telling can sometimes be more productive than discovery. So what does my friend Tina have to say about discovery versus directive pedagogy? Well, the next rule is make statements. Whatever the problem, be part of the solution. Don't just sit around raising questions and pointing out obstacles. Knowing when to place the cognitive load entirely on students and knowing when to take some of it on yourself as an instructor is as much the marker of an effective teacher as it is the mark of an effective improviser. Tina Fey reminds us that always asking questions can be frustrating and can stop forward progress in a scene. It's disingenuous to pretend that you don't know the answer to a question. In my own classroom, I often distinguish between questions for which I have an answer that I'm looking for and questions for which I do not have an answer. While both are questions and invite students to participate in the learning setting, they are substantively different. Making statements frames both type of questions as legitimate in the classroom. 
Tina Fey's example about mistakes is especially evocative here. She says, if I start a scene as what I think is very clearly a cop riding a bicycle, but you think I'm a hamster in a hamster wheel, guess what? Now I'm a hamster in a hamster wheel. I'm not gonna stop everything to explain to you that I was really supposed to be on a bike. Who knows, maybe I'll end up being a police hamster who's been put on hamster wheel duty because I'm too much of a loose cannon in the field. That's Tina Fey's joke, not mine. I see this as structuring teaching and learning in two ways. First, it refers us back to this cognitivist idea of constructivism around conceptual change. Learners are always using prior knowledge to make sense of new ideas. And when their conceptual understanding doesn't match our own, telling them no and then giving them the right answer does nothing for them cognitively. New information needs to be fitted to already existing information. And learners need to understand the connections in order to rebuild concepts. And learners don't just make up random answers. Rather, they're providing ideas from a place of trying to make sense. So, cognitively, a mistake is fundamentally an opportunity. Second, seeing mistakes as opportunities allows us to take back failure as an integral, necessary part of learning, rather than as a demonstration of a lack of learning. In modern schooling discourse, we use failure to describe the state of not doing something right. We apply it to schools, to teachers, and of course, to students. This form of discourse is actively destructive to the classroom environment because it constructs learning as binary. You're a good student or you aren't. You did well on the test or you didn't, rather than as a process of doing and becoming. By seeing mistakes as opportunities, teachers and students can ask of a learning process, what happened here? What did I mean to have happen? And what are the alignments and misalignments between those two? In this way, improv mirrors the ideation and iteration process in design thinking, which we all engage in, and which is becoming more popular as a progressive pedagogical approach in K-12 classrooms. So here's the caveat. Applying these rules to a teaching setting is not trivial. Committing to the work and scaffolding genuine risk-taking in your classroom is required. About teaching improv as an art form, Leap says, when your students understand that you are experimenting, that you are willing to take risks yourself, then the expectation of expert is removed from the work and the group will take more ownership of the process. For any of you who've ever tried to take these kind of risks as your classroom, you know that it can be upsetting for teachers to lose control of the expert expectation. The rules of improv can scaffold the change in this power dynamic, but learners also need scaffolds to guide their risk-taking in the classroom. Students find it upsetting when they think the teacher is not in charge or when they think the teachers don't know all the answers. My belief is that the structure of improv can serve as the means to make that shift. The second question that I wanna talk about tonight is to make a, a rhetorical shift a little from talking about how the arts function in traditional classrooms to talking a little about how teaching functions in the arts. And I'm gonna make a little bit of a nerdy academic argument first and then hopefully back into it in a way that doesn't sound quite so nerdy and academic. So the argument that I wanna make is that we need to make a shift as educators to the way teaching actually happens in art making environments, which I'm calling a distributed instructional system. And this is what happens when the power dynamic of the single adult expert shifts in the classroom. So I'm gonna argue that we need a model that can take the place of the long-standing tradition of the wiser, more experienced adult 
delivering knowledge to their younger acolytes. So many of you are probably familiar with this uh, popular idea that we have shifted as educators from the old fashioned sage on the stage to the guide on the side, which embraces a more student-centered model of learning. You would find this in a lot of um, K-12 teacher textbooks about how we ought to think of ourselves as teachers. The funny thing about these pictures is that they both still maintain the teacher as the sole adult expert in the space. In contrast, there are a few studies that identify alternative instructional models, team teaching among educators, uh, and the use of teaching artists in the classroom to help guide students' new literacy practices, like those found in the terrific book on Chicago's Digital Youth Network that I highly recommend if you're interested in looking at how some folks have really remade our model of instruction um, across classrooms and out of school spaces. But in general, we know very little about how these kinds of environments function. So I did a big research project where I studied a bunch of youth media arts organizations around the country, ranging from Appalachia to New York City to northern Minnesota to Chicago, asking what kinds of instructional practices guide these alternative models of teaching, and how can the arts help us to understand what might be possible in the future of teaching. And what I found, and the argument that I want to make, is that teaching in the arts is a distributed instructional system. Theoretically, this comes from a set of ideas in my field of the learning sciences known as distributed cognition. And why this is interesting and important, other than it might be something that you already know instinctively, is that when folks started studying learning, they became obsessed with what was going on inside people's heads as if there was the appropriate metaphor to unpack how people were processing information. Um, and as cognitive science evolved, they did a bunch of studies on how people actually think and do in the world. And there are some very famous ones with um, pilots landing airplanes and large submarine navigation. And what they found in studying where the knowledge for how you land a plane is, is that that knowledge is actually distributed across people and tools and time. So a person has information that they use to make those decisions, but they can't make those decisions without other people, without the tools available to them to process complex information, and without an understanding of the current context in which those tools are being used. So in my field, we're now pretty comfortable with this idea that knowing and doing are distributed across people and tools and time. Strangely, we are less comfortable with the idea that teaching might also be distributed. So in that model, we still maintain that where we are getting our information from is that singular fixed expert. So I did a series of studies with these youth arts organizations, and we ended up mapping out how instruction seemed to happen. I'm super unhappy with these diagrams now, but these are the ones that were published, so I felt weird about changing them. Um, what I don't like about them now <laughs> is the unidirectionality of the arrows that seem to imply that the students aren't doing any of the instruction, which is untrue. Um, and I also don't like that the arrows don't go among the different boxes. Because what this should really communicate is that teaching lives in the intersection among all of the actors, back and forth, and forward and backward in time. Now this distributed system of arts-based teaching, which again is probably familiar to all of you, stands in stark contrast to our current model of the teacher as a singular expert responsible for the content, the pedagogy, and the design of young people's learning experiences. 
Another reason I like this idea of distributed instruction is that it's also intimately connected to what we know about how people make art together. There's evidence that creative arts processes are also distributed cognitive endeavors. And my pal Keith Sawyer has done a bunch of studies on people who do improv together, both theater and music, and has found that this creativity is distributed across people and tools and time. Many of these arts-based learning settings require collaborative engagement, people and tools working together, that the processes are distributed affords what they have called, my favorite phrase, collaborative emergence. An activity that has an unpredictable outcome with moment-to-moment -moment contingency where subsequent actions can change the effect of prior actions and that this process is fundamentally collaborative. These youth arts organizations that I've studied often exhibited these characteristics and creativity in these spaces can be defined as distributive and collaboratively emergent. So we didn't go into our case studies of these organizations looking for innovative models of instruction, but it was clear from our observation that all of these spaces decoupled instruction in this way, splitting knowledge domains into organization and content and technological expertise, drawing on young people when they seem to have the expertise in a more impactful way than their adult mentors, um, and taking on multiple roles simultaneously. And in interviews, instructors, youth arts instructors, voiced the belief that multiple roles contributed to the power of their program by offering both the structure of traditional teaching and an apprenticeship experience in which youth were given the opportunity to interact with professionals. Their beliefs and resulting design are consistent with this distributed expertise model for the design of learning environments. In using apprenticeships as models for teaching and learning, teaching becomes this distributed act, determined by what the community is trying to accomplish, rather than an a priori set of goals that frame the teacher as always expert and the learners as always novices. These findings indicate that we can also begin to jettison the notion of the teacher as the single focal point for instruction. This is especially relevant for creative arts endeavors, which, as we've said, are fundamentally distributed and therefore sit comfortably within this model that embraces expertise as stretched across people and tools and time. So this piece of the work, for me, is not necessarily about teaching in the arts. It's also definitely not about how teaching in the arts can help students perform better on core academic subjects. Rather, what I want to argue is that we embrace an arts-based model of teaching as a new framework for the design of learning environments, especially around how teachers and learners can interact with one another in a classroom space. This approach is fundamentally improvisatory, collective, and risky, three words that are rarely used to describe our models of formal instruction. But it's with these ideas that we can engage students who are currently disconnected from formal education and transform our schools to better meet the needs of all of our learners. As a final piece of what I want to share with you today, I want to give you an example of something that I've made that I've tried to instantiate these principles into. In Madison, Wisconsin, where I live, I run an organization called Wuppensocker, which is an old Wisconsin word from the Wisconsin Dictionary that means something extraordinary of its kind. It is an artist in residence teaching program that serves elementary school kids all across the Madison School District and the Dane County Schools providing performing arts education in schools that currently lack access to any form of the performing arts in their school day. We bring teaching artists into the classroom who work collaboratively with classroom teachers and with students to create writing, to perform, to create improvisation, and to write plays that are then performed by adult actors in a professional theater space. 
we use some of the teaching models that many of our traditional classroom teachers have learned. And we try to focus on the ways that we know learning happens through the arts. So for example, we focus on creativity and critical thinking. Every week, we engage students in warm-up activities that are part of this kind of gradual release model of, you know, I do, we do, you do, where students slowly become more comfortable taking risks with their voices and their bodies by watching professional teaching artists, by working with them to make stories and ideas, and then to produce stories and ideas either in small groups or as individual writers. We also work directly with language development, as in many of our school districts, many, many, many different first languages are spoken in our Madison schools. And this is an opportunity for young people, especially those who've been told that their language isn't good enough, to continue to produce ideas using whatever linguistic tools are most comfortable to them in the classroom. We write arguments, about things we want to change in our communities. We write true stories. We write what the kids like to call stretch the truth stories. We write dialogues. We write silly stories. We write the world's fastest story so that you can't get freaked out about having too much time to come up with an idea. This is one of my favorites from last year. It's called Bacon. One day, a giant pig appeared and ate everything. Then a girl named Sophia killed it and made giant bacon and lived happily ever after. After 10 years of eating bacon, a giant pig came again and everyone was tired of bacon, so they let it destroy the city. <laughs> That's the pig. We performed this as a puppet show um, with giant pieces of bacon that got eaten by a giant pig puppet, um, and also performed it in Spanish because her class had many, many Spanish-dominant students who felt more comfortable hearing stories in Spanish language. We also think about the arts as engagement in identity processes. So we give young people many, many opportunities across a range of media to express what they care about. I told you that we uh, create arguments about things we want to change in the world. And those arguments range from things we want to tell the president, to things we want to tell our teachers, to desires that the world be made out of candy. Regardless, young people are given an opportunity to talk about what they care about across a range of representational means. And then we give them opportunities to represent those ideas, both using the written language, but also using their voices and bodies. So we come together during the end of every session and give students an opportunity to have actors, both adult and youth, perform the story that they've just written in a pseudo improvised fashion. Um, this is a recent photo. That story went on for like 12 minutes. Um, so one of those actors is kneeling down in an attempt to get her to move it along a little bit. I want to give you uh, one brief example of how this looks um, in the classroom. D'Eric tossed off this gem in the final minutes of one of our class meetings. D'Eric was labeled by both himself and his teacher as a struggling reader and writer and someone who had a hard time paying attention for a long period of time. Once upon a time, there was a dead bush. It was in a desert. An old man saw it and water it. As adult actors, we were inspired. When we went to perform at his school, we called it the story with no words. I thought I'd share our interpretation with you to try to communicate the power of representation, identity, language, and creativity all in one simple moment. This was captured by a cell phone at a show in a school gym. So the quality isn't great, but the reality of it is. And my research work in transforming kids' lives through the arts looks a lot like this on a daily basis.
Thank you. That was my cinema cinematography work uh, in that video. At the risk of pandering, I'm interested in exploring how these ideas I presented resonate with this community, whose art form is different from mine, but whose values I suspect are very much the same. I hope that our conversation can begin at the place where these ideas meet your expertise, and I'm looking forward to continuing that conversation. I hope that these ideas both resonate with your current practice and prompt us to change our practice to incorporate more emergent, risk-taking learning ecologies. Thanks. Thank you, Erica, for reminding us that teaching itself is a work of art. So thank you very much. It somehow s <laughs> it somehow seems particularly fitting for me to introduce the next president of the Inseco organization, and she's been very en engaged in her own work on what makes us connect is human beings. And the next president of Inseca will be uh, Holly Hanasian, and she'll become president on Saturday. And she's a professor at uh, Florida State University, and she's been very much involved in socially engaged projects and uh, a well-known piece called Touch in Real Time. And she's an international artist in her own right and has recently had work in Denmark and China. And having served with her this past year, it's been a real privilege. And uh, thank you, Holly. Well, thank you, Chris. And Erica, that was really a wonderful sort of broad brush of what we can look for and sort of incorporate into our own art practices. And I just want to tell you all that I'm just incredibly delighted to be here and to be back on the board. And it's been so wonderful to be here for so many different years in so many different roles as a student and as a teacher, um, being mentored by my mentor and now being uh, able to mentor my students and to be an artist and a colleague of all of you. And, and so I'm just thankful to work for you and with you. And, um, but I'm not really here to talk about that so much as I am to uh, sort of move things along a little bit and tell you the date um, after Minnesota in 2020 will be our next conference. will be in Richmond, Virginia. So that's exciting. And um, I also, we're going to have a little bit of a break, and then we will have our Randall session, which will happen in about 15 minutes. So uh, Vanessa German is going to be the performance artist who's going to be presenting, and she's going to be wonderful. So you want to like run and go to the bathroom and come right back, and get your seats again, because it's going to be an amazing performance. And um, for those of you who have been on the board in the past, if you wouldn't mind coming up to the stage so we could have a group photo, that would be excellent. And thank you very much. See you in 15. Mm -hmm.